continuation on our webinar series uh, uh, under platform of uh, Jaipur Shoulder Nikos. This time we have uh, with us uh, a sports physician and physiotherapist and some senior faculty members across India as well as uh, one guest from UK, Dr. Andrew. Uh, let me introduce one by one. The, uh, Let's start with Dr. Minaljan. He is our senior professor and former head from rehabilitation department, RRC, and he's uh, my teacher also. Uh, but du during PC time, he was uh, head uh, of RRC, and I learned a lot from him. Uh, we have uh, Andrew uh, from UK. He is clinical manager and a specialist in musculoskeletal uh, field. He is going to talk about tell us about where is the uh, where is the uh, uh, failures and the, where is the leak holes uh, in their ACL rehabilitation when players, they did not find themselves in their uh, sports. And we have Shikha. Shikha from, uh, he, uh, she is a uh, uh, senior resident in a sports uh, medicine department, uh, sports injury center, New Delhi. Uh, Snail Deshpande, uh, she is senior consultant, physiotherapy specialized in uh, shoulder physiotherapy attached with uh, Dr. Ashish Babulkar Clinic. Uh, uh, we have uh, two colleagues from Jaipur, Dr. Vishal Jain and uh, Vikram Yadav. They are uh, really dynamic persons doing very good, fine job at in Jaipur. And uh, I would like to invite uh, our moderator also, uh, Dr. B.R. Bagadia, Vishal Jain, as well as Vikram Yadav. Are you there, Vikram? Uh, now I want to invi I invite uh, Dr. Minal Joshi as a, our uh, opening batsman in respect of their, uh, his uh, seniority. And uh, I request uh, Dr. Minal Joshi to share his screen. Minal, sir. Yeah. So if I'm right, I have... Um... I have uh, 10 minutes, Dr. Rajiv. Yeah, 10 minutes plus uh, 3 to 5 minutes for discussion. All right, all right. So it gives me a special pleasure uh, presenting in a seminar organized by Dr. Rajiv. The result, uh, being see, an alumnus of our institute, two. it's a special pleasure uh, to be here with Rajiv. So I'll today talk about, uh, it's a conservative overview in shoulder impingement. And this is one of the most common problems that we see uh, in our daily routine. And I would say I see almost five to six patients uh, every day with shoulder impingement. And uh, so I'll give you a conservative uh, overview in our daily routine uh, about it. So what is shoulder impingement? Shoulder impingement is basically soft tissue and trapped in shoulder joint. And patient complains of pain in elevating arm or lying on the affected arm. Usually, there is no preceding trauma or may have a trivial injury, which leads to partial or sometimes full thickness tear. Patients are usually older than 40 years, so we are going to see more and more of this problem as our longevity increases. And the subacromial impingement with the rotator cuff tendinitis is the commonest. And the goal of treatment is to restore pain-free movements and to have powerful movements. Now, shoulder impingement can be because of external anatomic impingement uh, due to acromial morphology, like we have Bigliani uh, grade 3 acromion, which can have an outlet uh, obstruction, or we can have glenohumeral instability, or anatomical abnormalities like ACJ separation, os acromial, fracture acromion, or a malunited fracture of greater tuberosity. And very commonly, I have seen uh, people who fall on tip of the shoulder uh, they have uh, trivial fractures, which we miss on x-rays, and they present to us with a shoulder impingement, and we do a dynamic ultrasound, and we see a uh, fracture there. So that fracture greater tuberosity, we see more and more, particularly in old patients who are at false risk. The other causes can be internal anatomic impingement due to a slap lesion or deep surface rotator cuff tear or functional overload because of overused strain partial thickness tear, or intrinsic tendinopathy like degenerative process and secondary anatomic impingement. 
Now, depending on our thought process, we can also divide them into anatomical bases like subacromial or a subcoracoid or a posterior superior inner impingement or anterior inferior inner impingement. So you can use whatever terminology you can, which works best for you. Now, before we go a bit more into the impingement, here you can see uh, a basic anatomy of shoulder. So now if you remove the anterior and the middle parts of the deltoid fibers here, we can see this subcoracoid and subdeltoid bursa. We have a coracohumeral ligament, we have coracoacromial ligament, and then we have a transverse humeral ligament. And along with that, if we remove the bursa, we can see the uh, supraespinatus coming here. And these are all the interesting structures uh, which we work upon when we are looking into it. Now, if I see the subacromian area, this is the uh, subscapularis, and here we have the long head which is attached to the labrum, and then we have here subscapularis and the four rotator cuff that we can see. I have covered them in a different uh, color, so which keep try to keep the the humeral head in its place. Now, what actually happens is. Now, if we see these movements, that during elevation, force couple develops between deltoid and rotator cuff muscles. Now, as deltoid contracts and pulls the humerus up and begins the elevation. Now, if we do not have um, the depressors, like one of the major depressors is our uh, subscapularis. And if we do not have subscapularis, we have problems with subscapularis or sometimes the accessory muscle, that is the long head of biceps, which keeps the head of the shoulder pushed back, it becomes difficult to elevate. Now, the space between the greater debrosity and the undersurface of acromion is approximately 6 to 7 millimeters. And the thickness of rotator cuff is around 5 to 6 millimeter. And so there is a very little clearance between the cuff and the acromion. Now, when we when we do our evaluation, there are various things that we do. We do a clinical history, we do examination, we do spatial clinical test, we work on x-rays, we do ultrasounds, a diagnostic ultrasound, static and dynamic ultrasounds. We also do diagnostic infiltrations or magnetic resonance imaging and computed tomography depending on our needs to help into the diagnosis. Now, there are three common tests where all of us perform. One is empty can test. Uh, the specificity for pain or weakness is only 50%. And the sensitivity for pain weakness is 89%. And the positive likelihood about pain and weakness is 1.78%. So, what I want to stress while talking about these tests is none of the tests has uh, a clear, specific and sensitivity to any of the diagnosis. So we have to work upon in total using our history, clinical evaluation and couple of clinical tests to come to a, a working diagnosis. Similarly, Hawkins Kennedy test, which has a specificity of 25% and sensitive and specificity for so impingement in particular is 73%. Sensitivity for impingement is 65%. And the positive likelihood for impingement is 2.41. And the third commonly test that people do is near impingement test, which has a specificity of 30.5 and specifically for impingement is 73% and overall sensitivity of 88% and for impingement in particular 65% and a positive likelihood for impingement 2.41%. So all of these tests should be done along with our history taking and other clinical evaluation. Now, something that I want to talk about that usually we don't is the critical shoulder angle. Even though we do it on x-rays, I have uh, taken a, a volumetric CT example just to show you more clearly. The critical shoulder angle is usually measured in AP view of an x-ray. And it incorporates, if you, can, if you can see the diagram also, it, it incorporates both inclination of glenoid and the extent of coverage by the acromion. And the risk of rotator cuff lesion is more if the angle is more than 35 degrees. And if it is less than 35 degrees, say 30, maybe 25, then you have a risk of shoulder arthritis. 
The other interesting X-ray that is important is, again, the acromiohumeral distance. This is also measured in an AP view. We measure it from the lower edge of the acromion to the humeral head, and 70 to 40 mm in men and 7 to 12 mm in women. And I keep it around 7, 7.5 as a critical distance. And when it is abnormally low, it indicates that there is a defect in more than one rotator cuff tendon. The other one is the acromiohumeral index, which characterizes the lateral extension of the acromion. The AI or the acromiohumeral index is equal to GA upon GH. What is GA? Gleno, acromion distance, and GH is gleno, humeral distance. The higher the AI, it indicates marked lateral extension of the acromion. The other two interesting views that I want to show is uh, the anterior posterior 20 degree outlet projection. Now, this gives us a clear view of the subacromial region for calcified tendon. Uh, and I want to stress because usually when we try to order these spatial x rays, uh, we do not get them. So, I have given you the positioning also so that uh, we can use these x ray uh, very well. And if, if it's done well, it helps a lot. And in last, I have another interesting X-ray, which is the lateral oblique 50 degree view or the outlet projection. Again, it shows us the uh, calcified tendons very easily. And as you know, the best modality to see a calcification is X-ray. Now, when we talk about conservative treatment options, there are a lot to offer. Immobilization, NACID, cortisone injection, PRP, physical therapy, ultrasound therapy, heat and electrical therapy, manual therapy, elastic therapeutic taping. But I'll talk about only a couple of them. The first is that I want to show is the ultrasound guide, ultrasound guided injection that we do very frequently. And here, if you can see, this is the AC joint. And uh, this is the geyser sign. And we can see the needle tracking into it. And we usually do an ultrasound guided. Now, I think most of us should do an ultrasound guided blocks. The space is very small and I don't believe you can do a blind injection. We stopped doing blind injection or the anatomical landmark approach way back uh, in 2007. The other commonly done injection is the subacromial subdeltoid bursal injection. Here we can see this is the bursa and the needle path. Again, it's an uh, ultrasound guided injection. 99.99% um, you just can't do it. Uh, without the ultrasound guidance. Then sometimes, uh, depending on what we have, we can also do a single side dual injection where we go inside from anterior aspect and we go down on the single shot, we do a subversal injection. And then we go and inject between the coracohumeral and the biceps ligament, the space between the two. And single shot dual, this is... Um, one of the area that we are looking at uh, currently in our research uh, for easy approach of doing it. And then uh, I'm just showing you the simplistic approach for therapeutic exercises. So basically what we need to do is the passive and active assistive scapular stretching. Now the important part is that when you do that, it should be in scapular plane. Because if it's not in scapular plane, then you are actually doing more harm. Uh, the strengthening of humeral head depressor so that we can create a subacromial space for reducing pain. And then we strengthen the scapular balancing muscle. And it is almost kind of the same thing that one of the doctor is presenting on dyskinesia of uh, overthrow or throwing games. And so again, uh, it will be interesting to see that presentation. And then strengthening of the prime humeral positioners. And because when we are looking at uh, a client uh, clientele of sports, uh, high-end sports person, then uh, we, should, uh, we should also know about the exercise equipment and should uh, suggest modifications for that. And there is a 70% success rate with chronic subacromial impingement if we, if we manage it conservatively. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Sir, for a brief and nice uh, elaborative uh, uh, presentation. I have a few questions for you. 
uh, for young, uh, if I get a patient of age of 20, 25 years with impingement, uh, uh, how to how to go with uh, how to evaluate and uh, what type of uh, physio we can advise and what point we should look in we should find a uh, pinpoint that that is the reason for this guy for impeachment okay so now i said in my presentation also uh, we have to we have to know what is the cause of it now in uh, the sports people that i see on our daily basis most of them are people who have throwing or shots kind of games like badminton or volleyball or cricket who do throwing activities or doing over overhead shots. Uh, ultrasound has become a very good friend of mine. Uh, after doing a clinical evaluation, I quickly do a diagnostic ultrasound and it makes my life much easier. And uh, there are two kinds of things that I see most commonly. And one is uh, tendinopathies where I can see a swelling and heterogeneous appearance of the tendons. And the other thing that I see commonly is the partial tears, intrasubstance grade one, grade two tears, which uh, we can manage with uh, PRP. We, we are working on that. We One of the research areas that we have is uh, uh, PRP for uh, grade one, grade two intratendinous tears. Now, the second thing is, as you know, as I said earlier also, that uh, the clearance of the rotator cuff is very low. It's around 1 mm. So the moment you have a bursitis or swelled up tendon, it, it, it becomes a cause of impingement. So instead of telling them to do overhead activities, we should tell them to do a restriction of overhead activities and try to work on the rotator cuff muscles because these are the muscles which are going to pull the humerus down. And that is what we need. And that is how we try to proceed. To try to strengthen them with isometric, isotonic, and then um, resistive exercises. And as things become better, uh, we are very careful when we are looking at high-end athletes because we don't try to use cortisone injections in them. As we know that cortisone injection on long term are going to tear it out. Particularly, we have seen very commonly deep surface tears or what we call as RIN tears, secondary to cortisone uh, injections. So we don't do that. And uh, so it starts from capsular stretching, isometric, isotonic, resistive. And I see them going back to their original level in next, say, three to four months. And that is important because uh, tendon injuries take time to heal, sometimes many, many months. Uh, one more question. As I know you, you are doing a lot of work on PRP. Yes. Uh, do you have any experience rega uh, regarding PRP injection in subacromial, uh, what I sub uh, suppress pantus, tendinitis, tendinosis, partial tears? Can you uh, share with your your, your experience? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Rajiv, we started doing it actually, uh, experimenting with PRP way back in 2012. And, uh, and we we have to understand that this is something new. This is a something new regenerative uh, therapeutic uh, option. And uh, there is a learning curve for us also. Uh, and on long term, many of the scientific papers that we come across, and uh, they, have, uh, they have actually say that a single injection works. But in my experience, that doesn't, that doesn't do. What I do is if I see a grade one, grade two tier intrasubstance, we give them an offer of PRP with all the exercises that we are doing. And then we reevaluate them at the end of a month. Uh, when I say reevaluate, that we do a dynamic ultrasound. And if we can still see the lack of fibrillar pattern, then we do a repeat injection. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thanks for your. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, and I, if I uh, conclude it, uh, uh, if uh, we get a young patient of uh, uh, with impingement, I think uh, one important point we should keep in mind is instability, especially in overthrowing athletes and overhead uh, athletes, because occult in instability is one of the major reason in this type of uh, uh, group of patients with impingement. Uh, we should not embark upon only on the impingement. We should uh, look into the, their scapular uh, uh, mechanics, which uh, I think uh, Dr. Shikha is going to uh, uh, discuss with us. 
बट स्केपुलर पोजिशनिंग स्केपुलर एंड अदर रोटेटर कफ मसल स्वायरिंग इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट विथ लुकिंग एट द पॉइंट ऑफ इनस्टेबिलिटी ऑल्सो नाउ आई इन्वाइट अवर नेक्स्ट स्पीकर ही इज अवर फॉरन फैकल्टी डॉक्टर एंड्रियू प्लीज सर डॉक्टर एंड्रियू जॉइन अस एंड शेयर योर स्क्रीन Hello, yeah, to... I'm just. You go. I'm just sharing my screen. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, any any comment from uh, Snail and Shikha? I'd like to comment on uh, Dr. Minaj Joshi's uh, presentation. It was a wonderful presentation, first of all. And uh, uh, maybe we could take this question last uh, in the presentation that uh, uh, when uh, uh, in throwing athletes. what should be the functional training and uh, what are the pitfall in functional training while doing that uh, when there is an there is a graft can you can you type your question in the chat uh, vikram your sound is not clear your okay. bandwidth is poor i think you just uh, uh, in chat then we could uh, take later on then yeah okay and now we uh, i welcome uh, dr andrew please you can you continue with your presentation okay, thank you Thank you for having me. Um I'm honored to be asked to present on uh, ACLs which is my passion. Um I've decided to present on uh, five common pitfalls in the rehab process that I see regularly. Um So here we go. Uh a little bit about me. Um I've worked in the NHS. Uh, I now work privately and I've worked in sport too. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a clinical manager. I manage a very busy sports medicine clinic in in London. Uh, I specialize in most things uh, lower body and knee injury but my real passion is ACLs um especially decision making non non operative versus operative management and return to sport and I see anything between 20 and 30 full uh, rehabilitations a year that uh, can include multi ligaments revisions uh, isolated ACLs and everything in between the aims of the session today are to highlight these five key key pitfalls that I see uh to discuss the evidence around some of these five key pitfalls and to show some strategies i use every day in clinic to avoid these and optimize the patient's recovery so just to highlight the five key pitfalls that i'm going to talk about today these are not exclusive there are many others um, but these are just the ones i chose to talk about today the first is just pushing too hard at the start not regaining uh, full knee extension not including open chain exercises I'll largely focus on quadricep exercises today uh, not using patient reported outcome measures and finally not completing the end stage rehab and return to sport testing so firstly pushing too hard too soon so uh, I just uh, put this picture up because this is classically what I see when I see a patient for a, a consultant uh, appointment perhaps you know 3 4 weeks down the line um and they've just got this inflamed knee that they haven't managed to calm down and as such normally they come with an extension deficit what constitutes pushing too hard so i've highlighted some things that i think constitutes pushing too hard uh often i see them off crutches far too soon their gait is not normal they're limping still uh they're putting far too much weight on the good leg and they haven't managed to restore extension which means they're limping they often have stopped pain relief because they're not suffering with pain all the time or pain is minimal but as such they're still not doing their exercises fully uh, they're overdoing hamstring exercises too early or they're pushing into hyperextension far far too soon whilst the front of the knee isn't settled down um they they tend to push exercises through pain or through swelling um they and they also may push that um exercises to the point where the the swelling increases after activity um those that choose to strength train too soon are also commonly pushing far too hard we need to make sure we have adequate uh, range of motion we need to make sure the wounds are calmed down we're, we're not dealing with any infections the patella is mobile and we've got adequate quad function before we really start to focus on pure strength training and another classic is running on a swollen knee I've chose to uh, make this little diagram this is self uh, self designed so you can uh, quote me on this if you like but this is just that early phase ACL cycle of doom uh, I would tend to start up here pain foot with swelling then they get this extension lag because they're worried or it's painful to push their knee back straight as a result the quads get weak then you start to see muscle atrophy that continues far too long and as such they limp 
And then what happens is they keep pushing and they just go round and round and round this loop. And what we want to try to do is break this cycle so that we can get them rehabilitating, full rehabilitating at an appropriate level. And as such, making sure that they can move through their phases. The second pitfall I've chosen to talk about today is not regaining full knee extension. And as you can see, this patient has got one of those knees that looks like it's pitching a tent. The questions I often get asked about knee extension, which I think are important to tackle around this. Surely zero is enough. In my opinion, zero is not enough. Um, we need to be aiming for symmetrical extension compared to the other side. We do need to find the right time to push into hyperextension. But if the patient is unable to get uh, what they would deem their normal extension, this, this can be a problem. Sometimes we do settle for a few degrees off of their, their previous level, but we will always aim to restore their normal extension. When is the right time to push hyperextension, if at all? So I've already sort of answered that. Yes, we do push into hyperextension appropriately, uh, but we need to make sure the front of the knee is calm so we don't risk flaring up the fat pad um, or uh, pushing too soon. Uh, what might be affecting me reaching full extension? This can, if you haven't managed to get there early on in the process, if you haven't uh, enabled the need to calm down, it could be swelling, it could be uh, the fat pad is irritated, or you could be suffering from something uh, called a cyclops lesion or, or, or arthrofibrosis, if that's much further down the line. Um, and, and it's key to make sure that we, we optimise their rehab so that we don't, we don't get to that point. And how quickly do we need to be restoring extension? Ideally, we want zero as quickly as possible, but certainly within the first four to six weeks. And the reason for that is the research suggests if we don't uh, restore extension, to zero by four weeks, we increase the chance of suffering. This is a cyclops lesion scarring around the ACL or just arthrofibrosis. This can be normally around the sort of fat bad region or, or, or within, within the knee, restricting knee function. So we need to make sure we restore extension early. I'm not necessarily saying in the first four weeks you're pushing into hyperextension, but we certainly want to be seeing that patient able to recruit their quads and get to zero early doors in their rehab. And the problem is, if we don't, we know it will slow down their rehab overall. And generally, especially if they end up having uh, further surgery, things like arthrofibrosis or, uh, or cyclops lesions as such, they're going to have uh, worse outcomes overall. OK, this is an image I've got from one of my patients. This is something I use commonly when we're trying to restore knee extension. This lady, unfortunately, came to me uh, around 10 weeks down the line. Um, she initially turned up with uh, a, a maximum flexion of uh, 85 degrees and she could only reach around 15 degrees knee extension. Uh, we swiftly whisked her off to a, a surgical colleague of mine who unfortunately identi identified some arthrofibrosis. Um, she had to have a secondary surgery to clear the arthrofibrosis, which was done arthroscopically, and she came to see me afterwards. Here we're using an elevated band-assisted extension alongside muscle stimulation to try to recruit those quadriceps that have been asleep for that whole period of time. Now, we didn't do this straight away. As you can see, she's not got any wound dressings on. Um, they're all well healed. And you can see there isn't any obvious huge amounts of swelling around the fat pad. So you have to pick the right time to do this. Um, but those strategies that are important from the start, as long as you don't end up in the situation this lady did, early swelling management, Managing pain appropriately, you know, using your crutches, using appropriate pain relief to allow you to move and optimize uh, your function. Restoration of walking gait is essential. I find people skip this far too much. You need to restore normal gait with crutches and you need to make sure you use gait drills to ensure they're using the correct processes. Quads activation, as you can see, I like muscle stim. I think this is important, and those uh, from the Delaware Oslo group would say you need to use it until they have quads function of around 80%. And finally, as point one, not going too hard too quickly. Allow the knee to recover and gradually bring that down, but don't wait too long. Settle the swelling, use pain relief, and you should be fine. Pitfall three that I wanted to talk about today is not including open chain knee exercises. This is classic. I hear this a lot. This is, seems to be a, a common debate. And if you uh, you can see uh, lots of clinicians talking about not using open chain leg extension exercises. Uh, and 
I think this is something that seems to be, we're holding on to this far too long and the evidence doesn't suggest we need to. So why might people avoid them? Uh, fear of in increasing laxity. I'd say this is this is the number one point and this is the one that gets raised the most. Um, number two, risk on damaging the surgical fixation. Number three, fear of pain around the front of the knee. I've just put PF, uh, PFJ, but we could be talking Hoffer's fat pad or, or sort of um, wound site pain. Um, and thinking that closed chain exercises will restore full quads function. So I have some uh, combating arguments for the for these points. Uh, sorry, and finally, uh, because they're told not to by the consultant. Now, what does the evidence say? Uh, I'll, so the evidence says the fear of uh, increasing laxity via strain as you can see, there's no evidence showing that increased laxity for open kinetic chain and closed kinetic chain group when compared by a study done in 2018. And this is if applied appropriately. I don't mean from day one. This is making sure you use the correct strategies to bring in the open chain, the extension exercises. Now, if you want to find a, a safe protocol for incorporating those, this second um uh, article here for Kuda et al. 2013 proposes a way of bringing those in safely for a graded approach, starting with isometrics and gradually bringing them up to isotonic with initially with a restricted range of motion. But that's something that uh, you can look into if you're interested. But I would certainly encourage you to, to bring these in uh, appropriately early. Um, the fear of PFJ related pain or anterior knee pain uh, or Hoffer's fat pad irritation from open chain exercises Certainly, there is more quadricep usage and there is more pressure through the front of the knee when you do this. But if you apply closed kinetic chain exercises such as a squat or a deadlift or a leg press too early, then you can all easily irritate the front of the knee too. So it's all about applying the load and the exercises correctly and at the right time. Uh, and I think if you hold away from open kinetic chain, you, you won't be getting quads like this guy on the right hand side of your screen. Um Fine, the final two, thinking closed chain exercises restore full, full quads function. Uh, this article here by Lepley, um, 2015, shows that um, closed kinetic chain exercises, especially in ACL reconstruction uh, patients, do not uh, restore full quadricep strength. Um, and if they if they manage to get very close, it takes a long time. So if you can bring in those open chain leg extension exercises that you can do at gym, you will recover your quads both faster uh, and likely get much closer to that 100% what we're aiming for. Finally, I think the first four points should help negate the problem uh, if, unfortunately, you're told not to. Uh, and finally, bodybuilders know a thing or two about building muscle. They use isolation movements. If we're trying to build muscle, Let's take tips from those that do it best. Final pitfall four, uh, not using, uh, sorry, pitfall four, not using uh, patient reported outcome measures. Now I've just, these are just some of those that are available, the IKDC, uh, the COOS uh, and, and the ACORSI. Now these measures are important because psychology matters. Now I left, uh, I, I made this uh, talk a while ago, but I left Tiger here because he's going through some real struggles and hopefully um, he recovers well. Uh, but he admittedly had his problems with returning from back surgeries and such as a result of um, his general feelings about his back and his confidence to hit certain shots. And this is these sorts of things are true in ACL patients as well. You know, though we know that psychological read, readiness is, is a way of predicting how well people will do when they come back from these injuries. Uh, we know that fear of re-injury um, reduced knee uh, self-efficacy are also associated with poor functional um, restoration uh, and as such return to sport final one pitfall five um this is kind of two points i've managed to sort of push into the same point i suppose that's cheating um but i decided to talk about not completing end stage rehab and and, and as such not testing your patient appropriately now this picture on the left shows uh, the sort of traditional Return to sports testing. I realise it doesn't have a picture of strength, but the, the four sort of hop measures that we see regularly. And this picture on the right is just a little snapshot of on-field rehab. This is this is or, or on-field testing, sorry. And this is something that where I think we need to go. So the picture on the left is not return to sports testing. It may make a a snapshot. It may help guide you about whether people are ready to go to end stage rehab. But this is not sports specific. It can be part of that assessment. But this should not be how we make the decisions about whether this patient returns to sport. 
Uh, and the reasons for that is we need to determine if they are ready by testing all facets of their performance, not just hopping and limb symmetry index. We need to look at how they move under sporting conditions, under sporting intensity. And this is why on-field rehabilitation is essential. We need to get them in the environment that they are going to return to. And if we don't, we are, we are allowing that patient an opportunity to fail. Fitness is often underestimated in this um, uh, cohort. We need to get them back to the physical demands of the sport they are going to return to. You know, we know that elite uh, soccer players, for instance, can play anything, can run anything between sort of nine and, and, and 13 kilometres per game, and most of which is under sprints and short intervals. So we need to prepare them for that. And as such, I, would, uh, I know... Uh, this article by Buckthorpe in 2019 really covers those pillars of restoring somebody ready to get back to sport. We need movement quality. They need to move well. They need to be physically conditioned for the activity they're going to get back to. You need to make sure you've practiced sports specific skills. This could be turning, this can be cutting, football drills, heading, landing, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then you need to make sure that you've restored that sort of chronic load. You need to make sure you've got them ready to play games and start to begin to be involved with the squad. Finally, in summary, uh, we need to try to avoid by uh, try to avoid these five key pitfalls, and I guarantee your rehab will be uh, better than the average. With around 30% of those that have had ACL uh, re-ruptures, uh, avoiding these, uh, these key pitfalls should allow us to re reduce those numbers long term. And completing the journey, end-stage rehab, good robust testing procedures that are not just hopping and, and strength measures, but include um, sports-specific testing and fitness drills, um, should allow us to continue to progress. And hopefully we can uh, prevent some of uh, these 30% re-ruptures and, and hopefully I'll see less and less revisions as time goes on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for a uh, nice presentation. And uh, we have a lot of questions because uh, there is a still uh, a still ACL uh, is a debatable topic regarding rehabilitation, regarding surgical aspect also. But still, we have our ESA course meeting. We are not a zero in which graft is better, which is how to put it. It's a single bundle, double bundle, or triple bundle. Uh, again, uh, regarding rehabilitation also. When uh, when do you see uh, first time uh, post uh, ACL reconstruction uh, uh, the patient? Uh, uh, at what time the patient approves to you? Uh, it is uh, 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 it's early post op uh, or when uh, when do you see the patient yes. first time? Uh, to be uh, to be honest, it, it 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 does vary. It depends where the patient comes from. But I'm normally seeing the patient within the first seven to ten days post their operation. Um, but ideally, I would have seen that patient um, before they've had the surgery. So I'm always looking for six or twelve weeks to prehabilitate that patient for for surgery or potentially to identify um, whether they can cope without surgery if it, if appropriate if they've got uh, enough sort of rotational stability. And, uh, and your rehabilitation protocol changes with the graft uh, which the surgeon used, it's BPTP, BPT or uh, uh, hemistring graft? Yes. Uh, so um, the, fir the, first, the first part of the, the rehabilitation sort of protocol as such will be different if they've had a hamstring compared to a like a quad tendon or a, a patella tendon graft. Um, essentially, those that have had... Um, quad or patella tendons are going to do a little bit less isolated quad stuff at the start because we need that quad to calm down. You don't want to really annoy that um, area where you've taken the graft from. And similarly, if you're going to get a hamstring early doors, you're not going to in the first six weeks really push that hamstring hard. You might do some isolated, simple sort of hamstring activations, but if you really push that hamstring hard for strength at the start and they've just had uh, their graft uh, donor site from there, then you can really flare things up and slow them down. So it's, it's about where we bias the kind of early stuff um, depends on which type of graph they've had, for instance. Okay. And uh, one more question. Uh, for say patient have uh, a stiffness uh, post ACL surgery uh, and uh, you don't, you, you find it difficult to get the range of motion and flexion particularly at what point of time you stop putting the pressure and uh, ask or suggest the patient to go for arthroscopy again. Uh, I'm talking about uh, stiffness, post-ACL uh, stiffness. Yeah, so um, 
this I guess this this comes a little bit with if you're seeing if it's only flexion based stiffness and extension is restored, um, then I think you have a little more time as long as you're well past 90 degrees. If I'm not getting them into extension and I'm not getting them into flexion, let's say more than 90 degrees, I'm starting to worry at four, five, six weeks already. Um, and I'll have already had um, a telephone call with the consultant that's referred that patient to me and just say, look, this patient doesn't seem to be going so well early. Um, give me a week, give me two weeks, let's see if it changes. But I think the key there is if it's changing slightly in your session, but then they're coming back to you a couple of days later and it's back to where you started, you've not made any kind of noticeable gains each session where it's actually improving, you should be concerned. Um, and, and that can come, you know, you might already be getting feelings of that around the three, four, five, six week marks. Now that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to jump in and do an arthroscopy, but you certainly should be having that dialogue with your consultant to make sure that you're both um, understand the position the patient's in. And it could be that you bring a, a follow up forward with the consultant so they can go and have a look. And, and sometimes this doesn't need uh, addressing. It may just be something that they need to have a look at. And, and if they're comfortable and happy and uh, or whatnot, then you might decide to push on a little bit. But it's important to have that open communication, I find. Mm, OK. And uh, at what uh, uh, in the post of uh, rehabilitation, at what uh, at in terms of weeks, uh, do you advise open chain kinetic exercise to the patients? Yeah, so that depends. I, I wouldn't start um, resisted open chain ex exercises for a period of time, but they should be doing some isometric uh, open chain knee extension exercises within the first four weeks, really, just against a very light, maybe just against their foot or a gentle band, just in very restricted range. Um but as soon as they've got quads function, I may ask them to do non-resisted, just open chain, you know, just leg straightening, sitting on a chair, you know, very early, very early, a couple of weeks once the wounds have started to settle, but not against resistance. And that's the key. You need to grade the resistance as appropriate. Um, I know it's very common for people to say, wait till 12 weeks, but that Fukuda article in 2013 lays out a very nice protocol that I tend to follow. So if you're interested, that's a great article to go and read. Uh, there is a suggestion or comment uh, in the chat box. BFR training is useful for uh, gaining girth of muscle. Uh, related to this, my question is uh, some patients come to us uh, even after six months or eight months after surgery, they have cordyceps wasting and they are really concerned with that. Uh, any tips uh, to avoid this and how to manage that? And as well as what is BFR training? Uh, do you have any, uh, you can put some comment on that? Yeah, so BFR training is blood flow restriction. Um, like imagine a um, taking your blood pressure, uh, something on your arm, you'd get a cuff and you put it around just above the, at the top of the thigh. You restrict the blood flow into the quadricep muscle. And as such, there's some evidence to suggest that that's going to increase hypertrophy or muscle uh, size growth and strength improvements early doors when you can't use a lot of resistance. The benefit is you can use around 30% of uh, the resistance required to strengthen a muscle um, uh, compared to what you would if you weren't using BFR. So you can really ramp up the strength gains with very little resistance, which is excellent. Um, in terms of trying to restrict the, the strength losses that uh, happen and which we see quite regularly at the six and the nine months, the first things are you need to isolate the muscles er, er, much earlier than that. So we've already spoken about open chain, but also you need to be thinking single leg exercises. And I often see far too long into the, the rehab process, people are still just double leg squatting or double leg deadlifting or um, leg pressing two legs. And once they're once it's appropriate and once they can tolerate biasing one, especially the ACL leg, you know, single leg pressing, lunging, split squatting, single leg deadlift, really you need to bias that leg early because they can find a way to cheat for a long time. Um, so if you're allowing them the opportunity to do that by always doing two legs in the same position at the same time, then they will present with deficits later on in the rehab. So you need to make sure you can isolate, you need to make sure you do single leg exercises and consider things like muscle stim and BFR early. Okay, as you see, a lot of sports uh, players, uh, uh, just a few simple tips. When uh, do you advise them Advise them that you are fit to the sports again? Best because they are really concerned, the sports players really concerned with their career and the re tear re rupture of uh, ACL. At what point of time you advise them that you are fit 
and go back to their sports. Uh, just in simple few tips, we can yeah, suggest so to our patient also. Yeah, the, the key is that I would never give them a tip over time, um, but they, sh- as in time, is not a criteria. But they should be beyond nine months, and a Grin- the the Grindem article is a is an excellent one that shows that. Um, but they need to be passing the criteria to return to sport, so they must have you know, at least 90, 95% of their hot distance. They need to be well greater than 90% on their um, strength and they need to be passing outdoor, on-field rehabilitation exercise protocols which are designed to mimic their sport. And that needs to be customised to that person. Um, So it's never never sooner than nine months, in my opinion, unless unless we're talking elite, elite, soccer players that are playing in you know the premier league which have uh, monetary type of pressures as well as just the kind of natural but the players that i see never more and never sooner than nine months strength and hopping measures alongside on-field sport specific testing which needs to be custom to that person uh do you go with the gait or motion analysis something uh, we do do we do do gait uh, and motion analysis um, as they get to that period of time. Um, we do we tend to do that when they're returning to running rather than uh, late down down the track. Um, but we do do uh, motion analysis for cutting and change of direction tasks as we start to return to that as well to ensure uh, that they're uh, changing direction in a correct way to avoid dynamic valgus and such. Okay, thank you from my side, Vishal. You want to ask any question? And Dr. Minal, you want to put uh, you want to. Uh, 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 want to make a comment? Uh, yes, uh, one question uh, Andrew, from my side. Uh, uh, according to uh, uh, the outcome after ACL reconstruction, uh, what do you believe in functional testing is good or clinical testing is good or subjective assessment is good? What? Uh, so do you mean one, one or the other, sorry? Uh, the question is how you decide which one is uh, it's a functional testing it's a mechanical or it's a subjective uh, how you decide this the patient is going uh, is doing good in oh, terms sorry. of rehabilitation post okay, surgery yeah i understand so it would always be um so we would not, it would be objective data for for lots of the tests so say for instance we would do using an agility test we would use something like an illinois agility test or a t test and we would use versus either their previous scores that they may have done pre the surgery, or if if you're talking about an elite athlete, you're going to have lots of this data already. If you're not talking about an elite athlete, we would use against normative data. So somebody around that age category, uh, somebody around um, who does that sport, you might use data. Let's say we're talking about uh, like an agility T test, for instance, we know that if they're not doing that in faster than 11 seconds, um, then that's 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 not fit to return to sport for most soccer players, for instance. So we would try to find normative data for their testing um, to make sure that they're reaching criteria which is specific to their sport. So uh, it depends on the test, but we'd always try to use it objectively versus uh, like data measures that we can use comparatively. I hope that answers the question. Uh. Okay, thank you, thank you. It's a really, really very interactive, uh, interesting uh, uh, lecture. Thanks for joining us, Andrew. Uh, and uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Shikha. Uh, she is senior resident in uh, Sports Injury Center, and she is going to Shikha. You can uh, share your screen. Yes, yes, I'm. Uh, Dr. Shikha? Yes, um, uh, my yeah. screen is visible? Uh, not right now, no. Okay, because I have already shared my screen. I'm, I'm trying it again. Yeah. Unshare and uh, again reshare. Yes, I'm doing it. Yeah, no, it's okay. Yeah. 
is it visible yeah it's visible and uh, and uh, clearly audible also okay thank you uh make it full screen slide show okay. Okay. Is it visible sir? Yeah, it's visible. Okay. So my topic for today's talk okay, I think it is it is on autoplay. I'll need to stop it. Shikha, if you find find any problem, we can uh, start our next speaker. Yes, actually, uh, let me try it again. Then I think if it won't be possible, you can try. Okay, it okay, okay. Do 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 one more. Actually, it is on the auto mode, and it is not stopping. Okay. You don't make it to full screen. Uh, we can uh, uh, we can uh, see if we can manage with. Yes, I'm trying to actually, but then uh, it's not uh, happening. Yeah. I'm trying it again. Okay, is it fine now? Okay, Shika, go ahead. Okay, uh, a very good evening, everybody. Uh, sorry for the interruption. So, my topic for the today's talk is capillary dyskinesia. I'm myself, Dr. Shikha Hondial, currently working as a senior resident in the Department of Sports Medicine, Sports Injury Center, Subdivision Hospital. Now, before uh, starting with the talk, I would like to give a brief description about the sports and the exercise medicine as such. Uh, it is evolving as a specialist medical discipline that includes a variety of tasks and responsibilities, which includes injury and illness prevention, injury diagnosis, treatment and rehabilitation, management of medical problems, performance enhancement through training, sports nutrition and psychology, exercise prescription in health and chronic disease states, exercise prescription in spatial subpopulations, medical care of sporting teams and events, 
medical care in situation of the altered physiology, such as altitude, environmental extremes, or at depth dealing with the ethical issues, such as the problems of drug abuse in sports. Scapular dyskinesia. It is one of the components of the syndrome, which is known as sick, and which includes scapular malposition, inferior medial border prominence, coracoid pain and malposition, and dyskinesis of the scapular movement. As we can see in the picture, that the uh, affected scapula is basically dropped down as compared to the normal one. Now, the dyskinesis of the scapula, as per the definition, it is abnormal static or dynamic scapular motion, which has been characterized by medial border prominence, inferior angle prominence, and or early scapular elevation or shrugging on arm elevation, rapid downward rotation during the arm lowering. Now, the types of six scapula, they are basically of three types. The type one, which includes the inferomedial prominence of the scapula, type two being the medial border prominence of scapula, and type three being the superomedial prominence of scapula, while type one and two associated with the labral pathology and type three associated with the rotator cuff tendinitis. Type 1, 6 scapula. It is the inframedial scapular border prominence at rest, and there is an increase in the prominence, lack of acromial elevation, and lack of pull retraction on the cocking activities. It is associated with inflexibility of the pectoralis major and the minor, and the weakness of the lower trapezius, serratus interior, and the rhomboidus muscle. Type 2, 6 scapula. There is an entire medial border winging at rest, which becomes more prominent with the cocking or the elevation of the arm. It is associated with the upper and the lower trapezius and the rhomboidus weakness with a little anterior inflexibility. While type 3 scapula, which is the superior uh, medial border prominence, it is not associated with the superior labral lesions, which displays prominence of the superior medial border of the scapula. It is mostly associated with the impingements and the rotator cuff symptoms. Now, talking about the clinical presentation of the uh, six scapula as such, so basically uh, there is the enfera which is, uh, these are basically the goniometric measurements which will need to be taken while examining the patients, uh, which is the visual appearance of a dropped scapula due to scapular tilting or the protraction. It is a difference in the vertical height of the supramedial scapular angle of the dropped scapula in centimeters compared with the contralateral supramedial angle. While the lateral displacement is a difference in centimeters of the supramedial scapular angle from the midline between the sick and the contralateral scapula while the abduction is difference in the angular degrees that has to be measured from the goniometer of the medial scapular margin from the plumb midline between the skip and the contralateral scapula. Now, this is a pictorial uh, uh, description of a patient where we'll, uh, how we'll need to examine for the six scapula is that you just need to uh, take uh, certain markings for the same, that uh, the marking has to be taken along the uh, midline of the uh, along the plumb midline and uh, the medial border of the prominence. Then the second important thing what you'll need to do is you'll need to identify the inferior border of the scapula. And uh, one needs to see that how much is the difference between the inferior border of both the scapula. Now, how much is the difference of that medial border from the plumb midline, the superior medial border in centimeters from the midline of the plumb, and the abduction that needs to be calculated from the goniometer and how much is the angle that has been obtained by the medial border of the uh, scapula from the plumb midline. Now the clinical presentation. Scapular malposition, it is the most common clinical presentation of a sick scapula. It's either present either singly or in combination of the inferior abduction and the lateral displacement, either in static and the dynamic position. One needs to perform a forward flexion in the full range of motion and see at what range it's showing malposition and similarly raising it in scapular plane to nullify the effect of the new uh, glenohumeral joint. Now the pathophysiology, it says that the coracoid static malposition and the dyskinesis that it produced, it is because of the ellipsoid shape of the thorax as the scapula tilts anteriorly, it protracts and abducts. It tends to ride up over the top of the thorax. The coracoid tilts antero inferiorly and moves laterally from the midline. The pectoralis minor and the short head of the biceps become adaptively tight, and this tightness increases the scapular malposition, which lowers the leading edge of the acromion and decreases the ability to achieve full forward flexion of the arm. Impingement-like uh, symptoms result from the antero inferior angulation of the acromion because of the scapular protraction. 
Now, the posterior superior periscapular and the lower paracervical pain is the second common symptom that needs to be present. There is a marked tenderness at the supramedial angle of the affected scapula in the area of the insertion of levator scapuli muscle. As the scapula tilts and rotates laterally, there's a traction on the levator scapuli, which creates pain and muscle spasm. And that has been relieved by the scapular retraction test, which I'll be explaining in the next slide. Now, the third complaint of the patient is the subacromial pain. There is a malposition dyskinetic acromion, as we have already discussed in the pathophysiology, which resulting from the scapular protraction. It is not a true mechanical subacromial impingement produced by a type 3 acromion with an anterior astrophyte. Positive subacromial impingement test that brings about the proximal lateral arm pain. Then comes the acromioclavicular joint pain, which is relatively discongruous position of the distal clavicle in reference to the acromion as a result of the scapular malposition. As the scapula tilts and protracts, its acromion process moves anterior, decreasing the acromioclavicular angle and increasing the compressive stress to the acromioclavicular joint. Radicular or thoracic outlet symptoms. The shift in the position of the clavicle in reference to the upper chest wall, particularly the first rib. As the scapula shifts, the lateral clavicle also drops anteroinferiorly, resulting in a decreased subclavian chest wall space. This space restriction may impinge the brachial plexus as it crosses this zone, resulting clinically in the picture of the thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, appropriate timing and the functions of the need to occur to avoid impingement of the rotator cuff and the bursa in the subacromial space. Upward rotation occurs because of the axis of the rotation is near the vertebral border of the scapula. Now, scapular muscle imbalance in the patient with the impingement. Uh, there is a force couple that actually been present between the serratus anterior and the trapezius. Now, together, serratus anterior and the trapezius it causes the upward rotation of the scapula to maintain the subacromial space above 90 degrees of sh shoulder elevation. During the first 30 degrees of the scapular rotation, that is 0 to 90 degree of shoulder elevation, the upper trapezius plus serratus anterior they work together to upwardly rotate the scapula. While during the second 30 degrees of scapular rotation, that is 90 to 180 degrees of shoulder elevation, the axis of rotation moves lateral laterally to the acromioclavicular joint. Now, lower traps plays a more significant role with the serratus anterior to provide the upward rotation of the scapula as the upper trapezius reaches active insufficiency. Now, with the serratus anterior being compromised, the torque is still able to maintain due to the overactive trapezius below 90 degrees of elevation. But beyond 90 degrees, both lower trapezius and serratus anterior being compromised leads to the scapular winging or inframedial prominence of the scapula. Now the clinical evaluation. The patient present with the six scapula, you always have to start by palpating the patient for the point of tenderness. The tenderness point could be the coracoid, which is more medial as compared to the lateral, acromioclavicular joint, periscapular, proximal lateral arm because the subacromial impingement was being present, bicipital group, superior medial scapular angle. Now the range of motion has to be tested, both the active and the passive, and we'll have to look for whether it is painful and pain-free. And the very important thing in this case to look for the gross internal rotation deficit in these kind of patients, because majority of the patient of the six scapula present, they are basically the overhead athletes, and the most important criteria to distinguish from the range of motion is the GIRD. Now you have to look for the root test for the rotator cuff, and we have to look both for the pain and the power. Look for the both for the tear or either the tendonitis is present in the rotator cuff or not. Test for the impingement has to be done in this case, uh, starting with the knees, Hawkins Kennedy, Gerber coracoid test, and the job through location test. For the AC joint, testing has to be done by doing the cross test abduction test, adduction test. Test for the biceps pathology has to be done, uh, uh, the speed in the gyrgyzans, and look for both the pain and power and later on test for the slap lesion. Always test for the biceps, followed by test for the subscapularis, and then test for the slap. Now, these are the areas of the tenderness that one needs to be marked whenever we are uh, doing the clinical evaluation of the patient of the sixth scapula. As I have already discussed, the point of palpation and the point of the tenderness that one needs to look for. Now, there are special scapular tests that needs to be performed. The first one is a scapular assistance test, and the second one is a scapular retraction test. While the assistance test is where the examiner has to stabilize the upper scapula, upper, upper scapular border, and assist the upward rotation of the inframedial border. Now, the scapular retraction test is where they manually 
he has to stabilize the entire medial border of the scapula and one needs to look whether there is an improvement in the muscle strength after that or there is an improvement in the impingement like symptoms after that so these are the two basic testing that needs to be done if the patient is is a suspected case of the six scapula now there is a 20 point clinical rating scale for the six scapula syndrome a healthy symmetrical asymptomatic scapula receives a score of 0 and the worst sick malpositioned scapula with all the pathological clinical components is scored as 20 score ranges from 0 to 20 and we calculate the score from first clinical visit and each and every follow up of 6 weeks the scapular winging being used as a functional measure of progress now this is a 20 point score where the patient data has to be taken the kind of sport he has been playing name and age of course of the patient the position he has been into the sports and the presenting complaints of the patient now in every follow up one needs to evaluate for these um, uh, these points and whether to check if, uh, the uh, the points have been improving in the coming follow up or not they are subjective and the objective measures that we have already discussed and will need to palpate for the point of the tenderness at the particular spots and the most important things comes the scapular malposition where the goniometric measurements that we have already discussed regarding the infera lateral protraction the abduction one needs to calculate them in the each follow up based on that the scoring can be done now the rehabilitation the scapular position is has to be monitored on a weekly basis when the affected scapula is more improved in position from its initial pathological position the thrower is begin on a interval throwing program continues the scapular program until the scapula is symmetric with the other side the return to sports and unrestricted throwing are as lord and the thrower is strongly encouraged to maintain an every other day scapular muscle strengthening program to prevent the recurrence of the syndrome now symptomatic six scapula presents with a score between 10 and 14 interval throwing usually begins with a score in the range of 4 to 6 return to sports as the thrower's previous level of performance is attained when the score drops between 0 and 2 in an adherent patient who commits to doing the rehabilitation exercises three times per day there is 50% reposition scapula can be routinely attained within 2 to 3 weeks completion of the interval throwing program usually takes 3 to 4 weeks complete symmetrical scapular position usually take 3 months the anterior tilt uh, apparently infera it is the first component to resolve followed by the lateral transplace uh, translation that goes away second and the abduction component that is loss of protraction control is the last and the most difficult to resolve now there are some patients uh, which i have encountered on my uh, on my follow up uh, uh, during the clinical practice these are the uh, basically these are the videos i don't think i'm able, i'll be able to play here because i have actually made the video of the patients of the six scapula okay uh, talking about the rehabilitation so the main concern when talking about the scapular rehab is treating the inflexibilities and treating the weakness now uh, uh, starting with inflexibilities the pectoralis minor inflexibility it will decrease the scapular posterior tilt upward rotation and the external rotation we will have to incorporate a sleeper stretch program for the same which includes a modified sleeper stretch a modified cross body horizontal adduction stretch and the horizontal stretch with a concomitant internal rotation which has to be compounded with a proper glenohumeral joint mobilization exercises now talking about treating the weakness it always have to start with the proximal to distal there is a posterior tilt upward elevation and external rotation and there were cases where the becker et al has uh, described that there was a scapular dyskinesia that has been associated with the hip abductor weakness so this is a sleeper stretch program which the patient has to be given for a period of 6 weeks so there is an improvement in the gross internal rotation deficit and it also will treat the inflexibilities combining them with a proper glenohumeral joint mobilization exercises Now, scapular rehabilitation the serratus anterior and the lower trapezius which act as a stabilizer there are scapular stabilization protocols which should focus on reeducating these muscles to act as a dynamic scapular stabilizers first via the implementation of short lever kinetic chain assisted exercises with progressing to the long lever movements a close kinetic chain axial loading to stimulate co contractions of rotator cuff and scapular musculature and promote the scapulohumeral control and glenohumeral joint stability 
they are they are early axial loading exercises which includes weight shifts weight shifts on the ball wall push ups and the quadruplet x drills axial loading close kinetic chain drills which have been performed to stimulate the articular mechanoreceptors and aid in training the proprioception now scapular dyskinesia with the hip abductor weakness we will have to ask the patient to perform a single leg squat if the patient comes with a scapular dyskinesia and what we'll need to look for is if there is an excessive lateral trunk displacement there is a valgus knee collapse excessive hip flexion any trunk flexion has been there lateral dropping of the pelvis and the lower extremity pain hip and the trunk flexion help facilitate the scapular protraction whereas hip and trunk extension along with the trunk rotation aid in facilitating the scapular retraction if strength or flexibility deficit exists within the proximal segment that is being core pelvis or hip then they should be addressed prior to treating the scapula or shoulder scapular exercises one needs to these are the list of the exercises the one needs to uh, perform whenever treating the patient with a scapular dyskinesia now starting with the scapular exercises that is scapular punch so they are uh, they, they are the punch out and the punch in exercises where the punch out can be done upward downward or in a diagonal position while coming back to the punch in it always has to be returned in the elbow in the back pocket position so that it can facilitate the scapular retraction talking about the second exercise which is isometric scapular retraction now the isometric scapular retraction the thumb rule that needs to be followed whenever we are performing the isometric exercises patient has to give a maximum voluntary contraction of 70% of it the vas core the visual analog core of the patient should be less than 5 by 10 and third important thing is the patient has to sustain a hold for a minimum of 40 for a maximum of 45 seconds then only you can progress towards the strength training or or you can say with the weight training of the exercises and the patient now the third set of exercises is the low row exercise which basically includes the shoulder extension trunk extension and scapular retraction so these are the coexistence exercises that needs to be performed a scapular wall exercises the hand is placed on the wall or a ball with varying degrees of abduction and flexion you can do it in a round the clock position of 12 to 6 or 9 to 3 similarly there are closed chain exercises as uh, as such which includes the humeral head depression plus glenohumeral joint mobilization exercises now the exercises which includes the wall washes that will actually facilitates the trunk and the scapular activation along with the cuff activation these are vertical and the diagonal wall washes that needs to be performed so these are the core contraction exercises that will actually uh, uh, do the strengthening of both the scapular and the rotator cuff now these are the punches that we have already discussed there's a certain set of the closed chain exercises that one needs to perform which basically have to enhance the retraction of the scapula along with the rotator cuff strengthening now the rehabilitation protocol uh, the summarized uh, rehabilitation protocol to be followed whenever we are considering the patient of the six scapula the, the major component and one needs to address is the gird that is cross internal rotation deficit we'll have to put the patient for a minimum of 6 weeks of duration a sleeper stretch program that we have already discussed now talking about the coracoid tenderness a lot of patient also has this uh, uh, the involvement of the bicipital tendon and they also complains of the bicipital tendinopathy so one needs to give the soft tissue mobilization for the uh, for the tendinopathy itself which includes the digital ischemic pressures and the transverse deep frictional massage for the bicipital tendon now the soft tissue mobilization that needs to be done for the upper traps pectoralis minor deltoids and the rhomboids along with that there is a strengthening protocol that needs to be followed for the pec major serratus lower traps and the latus muscle dorsi and apart from the scapular stabilization the rotator cuff tendon loading protocol that has to start from the isometrics to the isotonic thank you thank you thank you shikha for a elaborative uh, scapular problem and uh, really truly speaking uh, in our practice still scapular problems are hidden uh, yes. we don't uh, don't give and uh, we still we don't give so much importance to scapular uh, dyskinesis and lot of uh, young patients come to us with impingement we don't address them and we don't look uh, uh, scapular uh, uh, 
the movements. I think we should nowadays we should emphasize on the undressing of the patient and look at the uh, scapula rhythm also. I think uh, thanks a lot for your uh, uh, presentation. Uh, now I invite uh, Snehal this uh, this Pandey. She is going to speak on how to get a full range of motion after rotator cuff surgery. Uh, she is. Uh, Dr. Snehal, please uh, uh, share your screen. Hello, a very good evening to all of you. Myself, Snehal Deshpande. I am uh, a senior consulting physiotherapist in Shoulder and Sports Department, Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital. I have been associated with Dr. Ashish Bawulkar since almost 15 to 20 years. So basically, uh, today the topic is very critical and it's more challenging. Stiffness or full uh, range of motion after a rotator cuff repair. It's quite a controversial topic, uh, basically. And there are a lot of controversies and uh, there are a lot of challenge in treating the rotator cuff uh, patients. Basically, there are different school of thoughts when we treat a rotator cuff uh, repair patients. A uh, few people follow a slow protocol. There are certain uh, and some of them who follow an accelerated protocol. First, before going towards the rehabilitation, I just want to brief uh, what are the indications for the rotator cuff repairs. If a patient has symptoms uh, uh, for about 6 to 12 months, then they are uh, more prone to undergo rotator cuff repair. If there is a large tear, which is more than three centimeters, then usually the surgeons opt for a uh, repair. If there is a significant weakness or loss of function in the shoulder, then these uh, group of patients are uh, perfect for rotator cuff repair. Or if a patient has a uh, recent or acute injury and there is a big tear in the rotator cuff, then they are ideal patients to undergo a rotator cuff repair. So basically, there are different ways of undergoing a rotator cuff repair. Uh, uh, mostly followed as the orthoscopic, but certain uh, group of surgeons do also uh, follow the open surgeries. I'll just uh, brief you what are the advantages and disadvantages of undergoing an orthoscopic and the open surgery. Orthoscopic is less invasive. The recovery is very fast. There is not a big deltoid incisions. There are minute uh, uh, small two, three scars which are there or incisions that are given to, uh, for the orthoscope to insert the orthoscope. Through orthoscope, a uh, surgeon can visualize the whole joint. It requires more of a technical skill. And uh, in this, there is a less chances of inf uh, infection. And the most important thing is if a rotator cuff is done by orthoscopically, then we can start with the fast rehab. That, that's totally opposite with the open, the rehab and the chances of infections are more in the open surgery. The recovery rate is also very slow. So the most preferred uh, method of doing a rotator cuff repair is the orthoscopic rotator cuff repair. So for that, the surgeons use the anchors. I just want to just uh, go into a uh, brief that these are the anchors that are used to uh, do the repair of the rotator cuff. They are either made up of titanium or, or poly anchors and they have got a very good pull out strength. Then uh, th there are two different ways in which the rotator cuff repair has been done. It's, uh, it's either a single row or a double row. The most preferred or the durable is the double row method because in this we can, uh, there are very less chances of tear in the double row repair and it's mostly used for a big tears, but a single row if we can use for the small tears and uh, it's better to start the rehab a bit uh, after quite some time in the single row as compared to the double row. So in double row, we can start with an accelerated rehab. So that's an advantage of doing a double row repair. So now uh, I'll come to the rehab. Uh, basically, uh, certain, uh, like as I told you, the, uh, there are different school of thoughts. So some follow a delayed rehab in which they usually start the rehab after the eight weeks. 
but uh, in our practice we usually follow an accelerated protocol the advantage of uh, doing an accelerated protocol is it reduces the pain it also reduces the stiffness and uh, in further it also helps in strengthening because uh, if the st uh, stiffness is not there then it becomes very easy to strengthen the rotator cuff and uh, again there are different school of thoughts that if we start with the rehab early then there are chances of re tear but uh, generally what we have found is there are about 1 to 4% chances of re tear if we start with the accelerated protocol so there is no harm in starting the accelerated protocol so basically what we follow in our department i'll just go through it there are two different phases in which we can treat a, a rotator cuff repair patient first is the protected phase which is for the first 6 weeks after the surgery uh, in which uh, we have to follow certain uh, restrictions and then comes the rehabilitation phase which is 6 weeks after the surgery usually it takes about 6 weeks for the soft tissue to heal up so after 6 weeks we can start with the heavy uh, lo loading program for the rotator cuff repair patients so basically what we uh, do in the protected phase which is for the first 6 weeks from the day 1 to the 6 weeks we usually start with the mobilization on the second and third day the therapist has to be careful that they don't provoke the pain because if the pain is there then there are chances of reflex spasm of the uh, surrounding muscle which can damage the repair so a therapist has to be very careful when uh, treating a rotator cuff repair patients then after 3 weeks we uh, increase to the flexion and abduction exercises so uh, the day 2 what are the exercises that we usually give to a rotator cuff repair patients are the exercises for the adjacent joints like the elbow wrist hand exercises the second most important thing is scapula uh, setting usually uh, the patient have a tendency to uh, sit in a protruded position so giving a scapula setting will help us for the further rehab because if the scapula is properly stabilized then it can help us it will our uh, strengthening of the rotator cuff would be very easy in future uh, the third exercise that we give is the pendulum exercise to maintain the mobility then usually after a rotator cuff repair there is a loss of proprioception because of the uh, stiffness and swelling around the joint so to regain the proprioception we usually give a table top wash exercises to the patient again posture correction as i told you it's very important because it will help us for the further rehab and uh, usually we don't follow uh, we don't ask the patients to continuously put on the sling because if they put on the sling then they might end up into stiffness and secondly the muscle will also become uh, weak so basically the sling is on and off uh, like when the patient is moving out or when the patient is slipping that time we usually ask the patient to wear the sling otherwise the patient can leave the hand loose so these are the certain exercises that we follow this is the scapula setting which is very important to maintain uh, the scapula uh, uh, bracing then these are the pendulum exercises it has to be uh, uh, initially we start with the small circles uh, so as to avoid any pain to the patient we go uh, we ask the patient to do small circles initially then as i told you this is a table top wash uh, exercise that we give on the very second day of the rotator cuff repair surgery then uh, after 3 weeks uh, for the first 3 weeks the patient has to follow the previous program but now after 3 weeks we try uh, we start st uh, static deltoid and rotator cuff strengthening exercises so as to maintain the strength of the uh, muscle because if we don't do anything then the muscle will get wasted and it will become weak so to maintain the strength we usually start with the isometric exercises and also for maintaining the range we start with the active assisted exercises with the bands so these are the images showing uh, the static uh, shoulder exercises which we usually start after 3 weeks of the surgery 
then these are the band exercises and uh, there are certain restrictions that we need to follow for the first 6 weeks like the flexion is permitted till uh, 90 degrees abduction is permitted till 60 degrees and external rotation again it is very important so we need to ask the patient to start doing external rotation so external rotation till 30 degrees permitted because it will help us to further strengthen the uh, external rotators so it is very important to start with the external rotator and there is no harm in giving them the external rotator uh, exercise with the band then uh, what is the rehabilitation after 6 weeks it's basically the what we follow is the psrp now what is psrp psrp is pune shoulder rehabilitation program it was designed by my mentor dr ashish babulkar in year 2001 so it's a complete rehab program which relieves pain restores normal biomechanics enhances strength and gets the range of motion so it's a complete program which can be given to the patient and we can get a good result out of it so basically what is psrp's philosophy it's basically uh, uh, the principle is the kinetic chain in which all the segments are closely related and everything has been taken care of and uh, secondly the scapula plays a major role because scapula acts like an anchor and all the uh, rotator cuff muscles are attached to the scapula so stabilizing the scapula is very important so it plays a major role and again proximal to distal muscle activation and coordination is very important on um, this uh, this is the philosophy of psrp now what are the certain activities that a patient has to keep in mind when the patient is following the rotator cuff rehab program that is avoid throwing uh, sports uh, till the time it's been permitted the patient has to avoid gym they have to avoid swimming and overhead sports so these are the certain things that the patient has to keep in mind when we are treating the uh, rotator cuff repair patients so basically psrp is divided into three programs the first is the two week supervised program which usually the patient do in in the supervision of the physiotherapist the second is the phase 2 which the patients do it at home and the uh, third is the phase 3 which is more progressive type of a program which is the progression of phase 1 given to those patients who wants to regain back to sports or certain heavy gymming activities so uh, what we do after 6 weeks of the uh, rotator cuff repair is this uh, again uh, the scapular stabilization which is very important then correcting the abnormal movement pattern the usually patients do lot of tricky movements so we need to correct that and when we are strengthening a rotator cuff repair we need to keep in mind how strong the supraspinatus is if the if the, the tear was very big then it's better to go slow so what we do is for initially we start with the full can exercise progressing to the empty can because empty can puts more load on the supraspinatus so it's okay if we start with the empty can uh, by about fourth to fifth day then comes the capsular stretches we have to be very gentle with the capsular stretches because it shouldn't provoke pain because most of the patients do complain that they have pain after doing capsular stretches so it has to be very gentle we don't give more emphasis on getting back the range but uh, strengthening is more important rather than getting a range because once the uh, muscles are strong then we can gradually get the range but if the range is we get the range and the strength is not there then again the patient will end up into pain because of the impingement so strengthening of the rotator cuff is more important than going for the capsular stretches and as i told you that mostly the proprioceptive uh, senses are lost so we do give them the proprioception exercises which do help us for the strengthening and getting back the range so uh, i'll just uh, quickly go through different kind of exercises that we give these are the scapula setting exercises can be given in the prone or can be given in standing this uh, this is done in sitting or it can be done in this standing exercises make sure there is no elevation of the scapula it has to be braced and downward movement of the scapula that is very important then these are the certain uh, strengthening exercises that we follow we do along with the rotator cuff strengthening we do give the strengthening for the rhomboidus uh, so these are the few rhomboidus exercises 
again we do give strengthening of the uh, serratus anterior uh, muscle because these also help in the correction of the muscular imbalance then as i told you this is a empty can exercise for supraspinatus <clears throat> supraspinatus strengthening is very important so when we are giving a strengthening exercise program for the supraspinatus we need to make sure that the patient don't do any tricky movements the first uh, slide is the correct one basically this is the right way in which uh, the supraspinatus strengthening is been done the second in this we can see that there is slight elevation is going on here we can see that the elbow is bending or it's going above so basically supraspinatus strengthening has to be done in the plane of scapula until the range of about 30 to 40 degree that's the ideal uh, range in which we can actually target the strengthening of supraspinatus so we have to try to avoid uh, doing any tricky movements then infraspinatus strengthening it's again very important uh, for this Uh, as you can see we have taken a small cushion or a pillow over here which will help us to eliminate the abductors uh, and it will give us more uh, isolated strengthening of the uh, external rotators so it is more important then uh, the we do give stretching for the anterior inferior and posterior capsule then proprioception as i've already told we do give the uh, table wash wall wash or eventually we progress to scapula clock exercises then uh, as i told you after the patient has gained a good range and strength we uh, go to the phase 3 programs so basically in it's more of a dynamic program like phase 1 it's more of a muscle oriented program it's a multi, uh, phase 3 is more of a multi muscle uh, program so in this uh, we do uh, uh, we do give a shoulder dynamic exercises these are basically uh, based upon the pnf patterns so the strengthening is done uh, depending upon that this is one uh, shoulder dynamic exercise this is again a pnf pattern in which we do the strengthening but we have to be very careful while giving the phase 3 program to the patients this is again a shoulder dynamic exercise this is a rotational stability it's more uh, advanced type of a rotation in a, which can be given to the patients so basically in the rotator cuff repair uh, we have to understand what are the milestones that we can achieve by about 4 weeks uh, of the surgery about 50% of the pre op range is achieved uh and as we go down we can see that by about 4 to 6 months after the surgery a patient can go back to the uh, sport so usually till 6 months we ask the patient to follow the protocol and avoid doing heavy exercises and say about 4 to 6 months after 4 to 6 months the patients can go back to sports i'll just show you a few cases like this lady she had pain uh, this is the image before surgery she had pain and stiffness after fall and she was unable to move her uh, limb you can see the restriction in the range of motion uh, and after 3 months of surgery and undergoing psrp we can see that she has gained a good range you can see the right shoulder that she has got a good range this fellow this man had a uh, pain and uh, stiffness and loss of sleep for about 9 months he uh, and he didn't had any fall and gradually his range has got restricted he came to us he was he had a big tear and it was because of the degenerative he underwent the repair and after psrp and 4 months of surgery he got a very good range and the strength was also very good so basically what are the uh, things that we need to keep when we are treating a rotator cuff repair is 
there is uh, there has to be no immobilization because if we immobilize then we are going to reduce the strength and we won't get the range and the pain would be there so there is strictly no immobilization in our unit there has to be basic restrictions that we need to follow to avoid any damage to the repaired tissue usually the patient can go back to work in fifth day uh, they can do light uh, exercise no jerks that is more important sling as i mentioned uh, we don't ask the patient to continuously wear the sling it has to be only in public and while sleeping uh, to avoid any restriction uh, to avoid the weakness and restriction of motion there are certain things like as i told you in first 6 weeks we have to avoid extreme abduction and external rotation to uh, prevent the damage to the rotator cuff repair and uh, the car driving usually we don't allow for 2 months uh and as i told you no throwing and swimming exercises for uh 6 months these are the things that uh, we have to keep in mind when we are treating a rotator cuff repair patients and uh again the most important things that we need to pay attention when we are treating a rotator cuff repair patient is if there is any increase or in uh, pain when uh, we are doing the physiotherapy or if there is any deterioration of range of movement or if there is no response to the physiotherapy in one week then we need to uh, get back to surgeon and talk to him what uh, is there anything wrong going on thank you uh thank you snail uh, it's really true in rotator cuff surgery uh, as surgery is important but uh, physiotherapy has a very important role in getting full range of motion at what point of time you advise them uh, strengthening exercise in suppressed spinous repairs uh usually uh, as i told you after 3 weeks we start with the static deltoids and the rotator cuff so it just help us to maintain but for the supraspinatus loading exercise we usually start after 6 weeks of the uh, surgery and as i told you it all depends on how big or what the strength of the supraspinatus is if it's very weak uh, usually on day 1 we assess the patient and if we find that it's too weak then initially we start with the full can which do, doesn't load the supraspinatus more and gradually we progress to the empty can exercises but it's all tailored program it all depends from patients to patients great thank you thank you snail uh, now i invite uh, dr vishal uh, for uh, dr vishal please share your screen and i request all the speakers to stick on time please we are uh, getting uh, late is it visible sir yeah okay fine so uh, after this wonderful uh, session the continuation of the acl uh, post op rehab so today my topic uh, about that uh, when we allow uh, uh, when we allow a sports person uh, when we allow a person when he will get in the sports activity and all uh, we shall make it as full as screen yeah I'll go with slide show yeah now it's okay so the criteria for return to sports after entry of cushion ligament reconstruction so i make it like that uh, whatever the surgery uh, whatever a kind of surgery may be a single uh, double or whatever patella tendon or gracilis or in a hamstring uh, tendon whatever i make it as a cumulative uh, kind of so uh, some uh, points uh, and some criteria which will work for all kind of surgeries whatever the uh, reconstruction program is um, chosen by surgeon right so i'm not uh, afterwards i am just to uh, elaborate uh, i have just touched the some points how will it start uh, the, the basic program initially after surgery see uh i want to clear two or uh, some of the biomechanical points right now over here related to acl because sometimes when we are doing rehabilitation we forget uh, about the, these point but these points are very important uh, show very important when we uh, do the rehab program like according to biomechanics acl and hamstring 
ACL and hamstring work as a synergist. They are uh, they they are uh, like, like means uh, uh, agonists to each other. They are helping hand. Same as for uh, same 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 time as for PCL posterior cruciate ligament and the quadricep work together. Uh, uh, sorry, Vishal. Sorry to interrupt you. Your slide is same, not change. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, your slide is uh, we are seeing only one slide criteria for return to sports. Are you? We are changing no, sir, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, sir. I am shifting. Uh, sorry, whatever I am shifting right now, this is not in slide. I am just discussing. Okay. Uh, discussing post. Yeah. So, when we start the rehab program, initially what happened that we, uh, as a, as a government said, uh, hamstring and ACL is work together. Fine. Right. So, you after post operative, even maybe from the day zero or day one post operative, we have to work on hamstring initially. But sometimes we forget to work, or we always remember, okay, quadricep, quadricep. But it's wrong according to biomechanics. If we work on quadricep isometrics or whatever, it will give a, a stress initially. Initially, you can say up to seven days. Initially, up to seven days on the anterior cruciate ligament. Because we, as initially, we work on anterior cruciate ligament, and uh, sorry, on the quadricep standing and whatever the isometrics. It gives a stress over a new reconstructed ACL. Because if you work over quadricep, it translates the tibial condyles anteriorly, which is a uh, check by ACL. So again, if we are working on, on initial phases over the quadricep, an extra stress put over a newly implanted or newly, newly reconstructed. ACL. So initially we have to work for initial uh, seven days. We have to work on hamstring, uh, like, like hamstring, uh, hamstring isometrics in 20 to 30 degree of knee flexion. Same as for standardizing protocol, if I'm talking about that, initially we have to start the hamstring, uh, standardizing protocol for hamstring. After like hamstring curls in cone line position, maybe in sitting and, uh, and the sideline also. We have to start the hamstring standing protocol initially. After when the hamstring gaining a good results of standing, then we'll initiate and switch to the quadriceps standing program. Whatever the whatever the maybe with the TheraBand, maybe with the, the uh, maybe maybe with the uh, patient self registered uh, with the sound limb and all like. So these two things we have to remember when we start uh, uh, what is uh, ACL rehab. So these are the criteria basically which we follow you can uh, which we are following the phase four or phase five phase four or phase five means uh, after uh, you can uh, after fifth week onwards post operative fifth week onwards when that particular person when the particular person follow this uh, 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 fall in this criteria can be entered in sport no doubt at all is a tailor made. It depends on sport person to sports person. And definitely, it's uh, it's demand, and definitely is uh, his sports or her sports in which sports he uh, they are uh, choosing it. And which kind of uh, like a uh, sports person is it? Which kind of sports person is this? Like like full range of motion is achieved, flexion, and there's a no quad lag. There's no quadricep lag should be there before entering uh, uh, again in sports. A quadricep stand 85% or more. Again, with the uh, we, we can check in the with the manual muscle testing with the sound in compare. Hamstring stand 100%. Hamstring quadricep stand is ratio 70% uh, or greater. Single lap hoop, a single lag hoop. Uh, in a single leg, leg hoop, what is it? A single leg, uh, single uh, leg hoop. The patient stands on a one limb hoop as far as possible and lands on the same limb. The total distance is measured. Each limb is tested twice. The means of each are calculated. A simple means that the patient has to stand on the affected limb hoop and again stand on single limb single limb stand again stand on. Uh, on the affected limb, affected limb. Same as for time lag hoop for 20 feet. What is it? A time lag hoop. The patient hoops on a one limb, a distance of six meter, as fast as possible. In the uh, in the you can say in the uh, time lag, time lag and all. 
the total time to cover a distance how much fast how much fast with, without imbalances with, without uh, creating imbalance how much fast he's covered a 6 meter uh, distances that means a good prognosis vertical jump single vertical jump or bi- single limb uh, single limb or bilateral limb vertical jump no effusion definitely no any kind of you know, no effusion around the uh, around the patella or near about the joint and all no pain or other symptoms is there if that particular person fulfill this criteria definitely he or she can enter in sports and no doubt good proprioception because all the weight bearing joint especially in the lower limb after after surgery somehow definitely all the receptors around the joints and muscle definitely they are compromised we have to go for the good purpose have to the exercises before uh, like definitely sport person are doing like agility training and all uh, uh, plyometrics and all definitely uh, so good proprioception exercises exercise should it's not like that one point i have to mention over there it's not like that okay fine the Uh, uh like a sports person uh, that uh, followed all the criteria and entered the and entering sports regained the sports again rejoined the sports again that doesn't mean he or she don't require further exercises or discontinue the exercises no it is a wrong concept so continue the standing exercises continue neuromuscular control days like as uh, same as a proprioception continue plyometric days according to and related to their sport and progressive running agility program according to their sports whatever it is and a progress uh, progress sports specific training like this so for uh, standing exercises when we will start the standing exercises we have to start the standing exercises once the range of motion should achieve at least 90 to uh, range of motion of flexion 90 to 100 uh, degree range of motion of flexion and there is a no quadricep lag no extensor extension lag should be there after that it will take a uh, 3 weeks or some 3 uh, weeks to 4 weeks in between 3 weeks to 4 weeks whatever kind of surgery is there when in by in this time protocol up to 3 weeks to 4 weeks the patient uh, the person patient get a full range of motion definitely if not get something is wrong something is wrong wrong maybe in rehab program not start as, from day zero as prescribed we are not take uh, we are not uh, in talk, we are not talk to the surgeon who did the surgery what they did right so if the range of motion is not uh, achieved 90 to 100 degree range of motion of flexion and there is no should uh, quadricep lag then we start the standing exercises initially but again i am saying first start for the hamstring initially 5 to 6 days we we'll work on hamstring then we we'll switch to quadricep but never forget to hamstring again same continuous protocol will we'll start maybe uh, like this and the plyometrics and all that should be so this criteria there are three to four protocols are there available or uh, available according to that i make it a mix up which will follow on uh, all kind of surgeries and all like this is a small uh, a small presentation sir is yes, so over from my side thank you thank you vishal uh, for this uh, uh, presentation and the short and sweet and uh, just a few questions from my side yes sir uh, uh, Vikram, you want to ask any? You want to put a comment? Any specific point, uh, Snail, Shikha? You? Uh, I would. I would say that it is like very good. Uh, uh, I find uh, Dr. Vishal Jain um, very short and sweet and very nice presentation. Right now, I don't have any comment for that. Okay, fine. Uh, Vishal, uh, as uh, how do you decide uh, at uh, what point of time? Again, same questions. What I asked to Andrew. but it is in our practice way uh, as we see the patients now we have lot of academics and we have lot of now the young uh, population the parents uh, they want their kids to be in uh, in uh, sports and uh, now we are getting young patients with acl injuries and i have around last month i have two three patients 14 year old of acl injuries and what 
uh, any important uh, uh, point in rehabilitation of these kids, adolescents, uh, not to get re-injured or at what point of time? How do you? Uh, it's the, is there any difference in uh, rehabilitating the young adolescent crowd as compared to adult one? Yes, sir. Definitely, uh, sir. Uh, the difference is the difference between the rehab program for uh, adolescent and the uh, and the uh, adult is that uh, in adolescent there is you no know, skeletal maturity till till now. Like according to their view, so it is there something uh, something uh, challenging. It's uh, maybe sometimes come uh, its uh, rehab will uh, achieve so earlier, but sometimes delay. But uh, this is the only difference uh, skeletal maturity. And uh, and uh, about the cryotherapy tens, uh, how do you see they really help in getting the muscle tone and the muscle? Uh, do you uh, can you put any comment on that? Sir, uh, cryoth uh, as far as uh, concern about the cryotherapy and the tens of water IFT is initial phases like up to. Uh, up to seven days to ten days, it will all resolve the pain and all. They are not giving any input for muscle strengthening. Not okay, fine, fine. Thank you, thank you, Vishal. Now I invite uh, Shikha again for his for her second uh, topic, sports nutrition, and try to finish on time. Please, uh, uh, Shikha, share your screen. Yes, I'm sharing. Uh, is it visible? You are visible. Okay. Uh, uh, so my topic uh, is sports nutrition. So uh, talking about sports nutrition as such, it is a major contributing factor for the sports performance as well as for the recovery. Uh, now there are high risk sports for the marginal nutrition. When it comes to uh, certain sports, uh, uh, there is a low weight sports which includes chronically low energy intakes where the sports uh, person has to achieve a low body fat includes uh, gymnastic, jockey, uh, ballet dancing, rhythmic gymnastic, ice dancing and aerobics. While there is a competition weight where there is a drastic weight loss regimen to achieve desired weight category which includes weight class sports and, uh, that is judo boxing, wrestling, rowing, ski jumping. Now uh, the third one is a low fat where there is a drastic weight loss to achieve lowest possible body fat, which includes bodybuilding, and then comes the vegetarian athletes, especially in the endurance event. Now the assessment. Athletes' nutritional status, they can be assessed by anthropometrics, includes measurements such as weight and height, uh, biomechanical chem analysis, which includes blood and urine testing, Clinical assessments include recognizing the signs and symptoms of deficiency or the excesses. Diet history is a method of assessment that looks at what a person has been eating over a period of time. And the economic status, which is an additional factor that should also be taken into consideration when assessing one's nutritional intake. Now the assessment, there are some of the most utilized techniques to measure the body composition, which includes skin fold thickness, that is measurement of a subcutaneous fat with the help of the calipers that gives an estimation of the fat mass. Then comes the hydrostatic weighing. That is basically based on the Archimedes principle where there is an underwater weighing has been done to estimate the lean body mass and the fat mass. Air plethysmography, where there is a measurement of the air displacement to estimate the lean body Logical impetus analysis, the measurement of resistance to an electric current to estimate the total body water, lean body mass and the fat mass. Dual energy X-ray absorptionometry, where X-ray scans at two intensities has been taken to measure total body water, lean body mass, fat mass, and bone mineral density. Now the nutrients, there are about 45 essential nutrients that needs to be obtained either from the diet or the supplements. Their purpose is energy for every cell in the body, growth and repair of the tissue, regulation of the metabolism and provision of the water for every cell. Talking about the energy as such, there are three energy nutrients that provide calories to the fuel, the cells. The carbohydrates, which provides four kilocalorie per gram and can be generally classified as complex or simple, that is 65 to 75 percent. Lipids, which provides nine kilocalorie per gram and they can be generally classified as unsaturated or saturated, which is 30 percent. And protein, which gives four kilocalorie per gram, includes 10 to 15 percent. 
Now, these are the estimated energy cost in some physical activities. Basically, it has been said that the physical activities, according to the body weight and according to the activities that has been involved, the energy cost has been different for the same. As we can see in the table, that the judo is comprising of maximum energy cost that has been obtained. And that has been increasing with the increase in the weight. And uh, the, the progression has been increasing from the racing to the basketball and then to the gymnastics, football, etc. Now, there are other nutrients. They are not directly providing energy, but essential for the normal body functions, like organic fat and the water-soluble vitamins. And then comes the inorganic traits and the major minerals. And lastly comes the role of water, which is a very important factor. Uh, because for the hydration, it is a sixth category of the nutrients which is vital to the life of every cell in the body which compromises of 70% and it is a solvent, lubricant and the medium for the transport. Now the calculation, protein, carbohydrate and many vitamins and minerals need may be increased for the physically active people. Assessment of the diet for the nutrient intake, it is recommended to average at least three days to calculate daily nutrient intakes since food intake varies from day to day. However, in case of athletes, based on the studies carried out at the National Institute of Nutrition, it is suggested that seven days dietary records are necessary in each of the training phase, that is transition, pre-competition, and competition phase, including post-competition rest phase, as the training intensity will vary considerably from day-to-day -day basis. Now comes the recovery, which includes soft tissue massage, that is, even soft tissue massage contributes to soft tissue recovery from intense athletic activity. Intense training causes prolonged elevation of muscle tone in both the resting and the contractile state. This is often felt as a muscle tightness by athletes and occurs particularly during periods of adaptation may impair the delivery of nutrients and oxygen to the cells and slow the removal of the metabolites. Increase the tone also limits the extensibility and the shock absorbency of soft tissues and thus predisposes the tissue to the strain. Now, nutrition as a glycogen and protein replacement or the rehydration. Now, comes the psychology as a very important factor where there is an excessive psycho uh, psychological arousal or maybe an over arousal. Loss of rhythm, loss of concentration can also predispose to the injury by giving athletes less time to react to the cues. Now, there are the guidelines for the intake of the carbohydrates of the everyday or training diet of the athletes. We're talking about it is based on the activity where the athlete is performing. If it's a minimal physical activity, example, the, uh, the athlete is recovering from a muscle injury or bed rest condition, it includes 2 to 3 grams of the carbohydrate that needs to be taken. If it is a 3 to 5 hour per week of training for dexterity sports, which includes archery, bowling, golf, horseback riding, fat loss management and bodybuilding pre-contest diet, it requires 3 to 5 grams of the carbohydrates. If intense training, it has to be of 10 hours per week of training for power and team sports, bodybuilding, off-season diet, canoeing, football, martial arts, sprinting, tennis, and weightlifting require 6 to 7 grams, while 20 hours per week of training of endurance sports, that is cross-country skiing, cycling, Nordic skiing, running, and trekking, it includes 7 to 10 grams of the daily carbohydrate intake. And lastly, carbohydrate loading for the endurance and the ultra-endurance events like triathlon, on Ironman and Ultra Trail requires 10 to 12 grams of the daily carbohydrate intake. Now, the recommendation that needs to be done prior to the exercises that uh, that carbohydrate loading, which aims to maximize an athlete's muscle glycogen stores prior to the endurance exercises, which last longer than 90 minutes. Benefits include delayed onset of fatigue, approximately in 20% of the people, and improvement in the performance of 2 to 3%. Initial protocols involved. The depletion phase, that is three days of intense training and low carbon intake, followed by a loading phase, that is three days of reduced training and the high carbon intake. Current recommendations suggest that for sustained or intermittent exercises longer than 90 minutes, athletes should consume 10 to 12 grams of carbohydrate per kg of body mass per day in 36 to 48 hours prior to the exercise. Now, the hydration status is very important to evaluate before uh, before any event if the athlete is going to perform. The vascular status has to be assessed hour before an injury and intracellular status 24 to 48 hours before an event. Now, the fluid replacement that needs to be done based on the amount of the fluid loss that the athlete is having. That needs to be calculated by calculating the pre-exercise weight of the athlete. Minus it with the post exercises weight and divided it by the pre exercise weight into 100. Now, 125 to 150 percent of the final fuel deficit require rehydration. 
this is basically uh, the hydration protocol that needs to be followed if the athlete is following uh, a single day or maybe a multiple day event so if it is a single day event and the athlete is performing the event in a temperate area or maybe it is of the moderate exercise intensity that requires 500 ml per hour of the hydration that needs to be obtained if the single day event involves in a humid place or maybe of high intensity then 1 liter per hour of the replacement has been done if there is a multiple day event then the temperate or the moderate exercises were 1 liter per hour of the replacement while the humid and the high intensity required 1 liter of the replacement no recommendation that needs to be done during the exercises carbohydrate ingestion has been shown to improve the performance in the events lasting approximately 1 hour a growing body of evidence also demonstrates the beneficial effects of a carbohydrate mouth rinse on performance it is thought that receptors in the oral cavity signal to the central nervous system to positively modify the motor output in longer events the carbohydrate improves performance primarily by preventing the hypoglycemia and maintain high levels of carbohydrate oxidation the rate of exogenous carbohydrate oxidation is limited by the small intestines absorb the carbohydrate glucose is absorbed by the sodium dependent transporter which becomes saturated with an intake of approximately 1 g per minute now during exercises the hydration to be followed is 150 to 250 ml every 15 to 20 minutes now while during the exercises if it is lasting more than 90 minutes then comes the role of the carbohydrate electrolyte drink now, the calories has to be uh, the calorie requirement has to be maintained 300 calories per hour during exercises and the salt intake which is very important with 1 g sodium per liter of sweat loss for the event lasting more than a day now the train low compete high approach that said that training with low carb availability to promote the adaptations that enhance the activation of signaling pathways increase the mitochondrial enzyme content and activity enhance the lipid oxidation uh, uh, rates and finish fast finish hai na conclude fast different strategies have been suggested training after an overnight fast a further research has needs to be established on this case now the recommendation said will need 2 to 3 liters of fluid per day 1 kg of weight loss if you will show 1 liter of the sweat loss and fluid loss is 1.2 to 1.5 times now what recommendation said that hydration has to be maintained 2 hours before exercise is 500 ml every 15 minutes 150 to 300 ml and after exercise it should be 1 liter now these are the pre exercise few the 3 to 4 hours before you have to give 200 to 300 g of carbs moderate in proteins and low in fibers and fat 30 to 60 minutes before exercise it should be high carb moderate and low fat right now the role of supplements is important that will say that a balance that will provide adequate calories and nutrients but supplements will not make up for the lack of training poor nutrition and the inadequate rest and lastly i would like to comment on the carbohydrate loading which is it's a very overhyped uh, uh, thing in the sports that uh, two stage dietary plan to increase the muscle glycogen storage the stage 1 there is a depletion which is the exhausting exercises to deplete the muscle glycogen in the specific muscles followed by 2 3 and 4 there is a low carb intake and the high percentage of protein and lipid in daily diet is taken to involve the carbohydrate loading on day 5 and 6 and where there is a high carb intake needs to be done and the competition day on the competition day high carb recognition is taken not only of that uh, 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 of my talk is that the sports nutrition basically enhances the performance and recovery performance is basically on the back side while supplements can aid in the recovery and the hydration needs to be taken care of thank you uh thank you shika sorry for interrupting as we are short of time uh, the now i invite uh, yes. our one of the dynamic uh, colleague vikram uh, 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 just vikram please share your screen uh shika please on share your screen first yes i'm i'm sharing sharing it thank you thank you very much sir for your uh, introduction and uh, uh i think sir uh, the screen is being shared sir uh vikram you are visible yeah. make it slide show yeah uh, screen is shared yeah okay fine now uh, what we are discussing we are discussing right now basic principle of panasotaping 
and uh, right now what i was thinking what in my mind was that we will want to do some uh, taping part also if time permits first of all we'll just have a basic principles of what are the kinds of taping principles are our uh, our learning objective in this uh, small presentation would be just to understand what are the principles of kinesio taping and uh, we will be uh, understanding the difference between th what therapeutic application ki kis tarah se kinesio taping we are putting and what uh, how it is affecting us and uh, the properties of kinesio taping and to be able to understand uh, the benefits of kinesio taping now when we are using it we are using it mostly in sensory stimulation to the skin they are telling us that there it is a sensory stimulation but there are few studies which says other than sensory stimulation it also helps in muscle facilitation pain reduction by pain gate theory and skeletal and joint stabilization when they are going to want the uh, joint to be moved edema reduction it is very good in edema reduction scar mobilization it helps to the extent but not to very high extent how does it do does the sensory stimulation of the skin skin surface sensory receptors uh, tactile and kinesion thermal receptors are being facilitated by cns and the tape is applied on the skin to the uh, to stimulate these receptors how does it uh, reduces pain mainly uh, the pain uh, uh, being um, is, it is a abnormal feeling in the skin now it increases the sensory stimulation of mechanical receptors and in thus it activates the endogenous and uh, analgesic systems by uh, activating your all the analgesic uh, um, to the pain gate theory it reduces the uh, inflammation decreases pressure on the pain receptors gate control ke through karta hai what how does this and uh, it also uh, stimulate by uh, stimulating the touch receptors we put the tape over the side of the pain and it inhibits the stress muscle and when when we are doing the space correction techniques uh, we mini, uh, minimize the space among uh, uh, the joint so that if we don't want the separation of the joint uh, that the space correction the x taping is being very much used in sports and decompression decompression when we are using the ed for the edema part uh taping is used to facilitate or inhibit a muscle using the different tape tension and different position depending on your uh, this uh, where we are keeping it that uh, we are doing in uh, uh, origin or insertion part tape application direction will determine the muscle reaction that is inhibition or contraction where we are putting if you are just uh, uh, putting on the origin or insertion kinesio taping includes muscle contraction of a weakened muscles it reduces muscle fatigue and spasm it reduces over extension and over contraction and increases range of motion how it increases range of motion if the muscle if the joint is being uh, inhibited and uh, there is no pain that there, there is increase of motion just putting after the tape okay and uh, there is when when we want to do appropriate feedback for example when we are just when, when we are training a per, training uh, uh, training uh, paralytic per patients we do put proprioceptive uh, taping for the proprioceptive feedback and muscle reeducation how does it does the joint stabilization joint stabilization for example when there is ankle sprain in case we uh, we put uh, tape on the fibular side for reduction the load on atfl we are also doing in the mechanical also mechanical taping the mechanical taping concept in this uh, it is not uh, basically a kinesio taping concept it is more over a rigid uh, taping concept where we put the joint in a less uh, less space position and we hold the joint by tape it it is basically uh, not only by kinesio so it is with rigid also it is mainly through rigid uh, joint stabilization is very weak when we are doing only with kinesio tape a lymphatic and edema function there is uh, there are see uh, i just show you one thing 
this one lymphatic when we are doing this lymphatic taping and edema taping it is superb we uh, it helps in uh, reduction of swelling and pain and lymph uh, lymphedema how it does this is this is the way how we do the lymphatic uh, edema function uh, taping it does by uh, skin movement during the full range of motion is needed for lymphatic function it is basically reduces the negative pressure and uh, it facilitated by muscle contraction and relaxation theory su supports massage compression and active motion as edema reduction catalysis and lymphatic edema function skin movement during full range of motion is needed for lymphatic function for example when you are putting in the shoulder we need to see that there should be no range of motion restriction negative pressure mechanism is facilitated by muscle contraction for example when we are putting on uh, the shoulder part it is like uh, we are holding it and we are reducing the edema uh, possible negative theory supports massage compression and active motion as edema reduction catalysis and it is better than in, it is uh, very good when we are doing uh, uh, the massage and uh, other um, supported technique we find that uh, when i do in my clinical practice this edema taping i found very good result but we need to put it without any pressure we will do seeing in further what are the basics of applying kenoso tape i will show you the tapes this is a normal tape what we use this is a practice tape which i am telling you uh, showing you Uh, apply the tape to show in its stretch position now the stretch position are on uh, various uh, uh, percentage 10% 20% 30% 100% whenever we are putting for the stabilization part we are doing for 100% stretch never have a tension on that now when when we are putting a tape uh, over here we don't we don't put tape under tension when the at, at the end of the tape if there is at the end we put a uh, tension then there are chances of skin abrasion tension is only applied to therapeutic zone of the tape the tanker uh, the anchor and end should be applied just outside the target tissue area never on the target cell for example when we are doing a taping for your tennis elbow we won't put on the common extensive region the uh, the tape anchor we would be putting it uh, adjoining to it not on that we always uh, round the edges of the tape so that we are just rounding the edges of the tape so that it does not uh, get because of rubbing of your clothes and uh, anything other than that always round the edges of the tape once the tape is applied rub tape to ensure activation of the adhesion for example when i am putting a tape over here i have to keep it I will just see that these are this is the normal tape. What how we do this? I will just tear it. This is the tearing of the tape, and when we are putting it, we have to hold it like this. Hold the pressure ends. Now this this is the stretch. This is hundred percent stretch. when this 100% stretch means when the tape is fully stretched 30% stretch 20% stretch and around without stretch when we are putting it without stretch means that the tape should not uh, uh, when we are doing for edema and uh, we don't want tension over the muscle we don't put any stretch there are the various type tape ends this is therapeutic zone this is tape and this is tape uh, tape anchor y strip x strip these are the type of the tapes uh, how we do it y strip i'll i'll tell you how what is the y strip and i strip uh, in further this is therapeutic zone this is tape anchor this one is your tape anchor this is for edema fine cut percentage of available stretch when we are when we are doing a super light is 0 to 10% when paper off it is 10 to 15% this is super light just 
there is 0%, 0-10%, when paper of 10 to 15%, light 15 to 25%, and when full 75 to 100, when we are doing any joint stabilization. But one more thing, there should be zero tension on anchor or end, or end and at the end. Six corrective tape. Uh, now the, there are six ways, uh, six needs of corrective taping techniques. I would recommend three, uh, which are the in my clinical practice, which I found the best one. When we are doing functional muscle or facilitatory or inhibitory, when we are doing facial correction or scar mobilization, when we are doing space correction or joint substabilization, it is good. I I use it very uh, very much. Ligament and tendon correction, mechanical correction, circulatory and lymphatic edema correction, which I'll show you. Now, principle of kinesio tapping, that is muscle inhibition. Muscle inhibition, direction of the placing, uh, direction of the placing. Just, I just, uh, just a minute, I'll just uh, show you how. Okay, direction of placing insertion to origin. When we are put, uh, when we are doing it insertion to origin, we have to put stretch the tape zero to ten percent, maximum is forty percent. When we are doing muscle inhibition, for example, when there is a muscle strain or pull, we are doing this muscle inhibition technique. Tape tension inhibits the muscle. Tape rebound provides proprioceptive input and feedback in opposite direction and stimulates muscle lengthening during use. Uh, the main thing is when we are doing this, it helps us to reduce the spasm. And uh, in sports, when there is a muscle strain, for example, when there is a hamstring strain or a quadriceps strain, or there is a strain of uh, quadratus lumborum during back pain, uh, a baller is happening. Uh, when baller is balling and there is a muscle strain, we use this white taping. Okay, next one. Uh, principles of edema taping. Uh, now we use this, this for edema. If you have to tape over the edmentus, edmentus area, direction of the tape is not significant. We know we could put any any side stretch of the tape to zero to ten percent. Mostly, with, but I use in my clinical practice around to zero to ten percent. And uh, fan shape taping is most most common for uh, following lymphatic drainage uh, system. Tipping for mechanical correction, when we are mechanical correction, when we want to stabilize the joint, we use this. Tape, uh, we have applied 50 to 75 percent tension. Hold, maintain, put it. There should be zero tension over here. Hold it and put it. And there should be no tension at the end, but over here, 50 to 75 percent tension. Maintains the circulation, maintains the range of uh, area, uh, range of motion. And it uh, supports and provides positional hold. 40% maximum X taping technique is used. We also use this technique in uh, when we are doing any uh, trigger point uh, management. There are various signs. This when I was telling you, this is like uh, when when I have done taping for this is uh, these are the pictures taken from uh, internet, and this is I to just show an example of how we do uh, edema taping. This is for edema taping. This is being used when we are doing the rotator cuff uh, tear, or when we have to stabilize the shoulder, and there is a supraspinatus tear. We are starting uh, the taping from here. Deltoid and deltoid. Uh, first, we'll start. Uh, we put a uh, twenty percent stretch over the um, uh, tape. Put put in the deltoid. We are taking Y shape and uh, we are putting full 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 length to the deltoid. Then over the over uh, supraspinal disc, we are at the insertion and from here we are going to the uh, to the uh, spinous process of scapula upper and lower side
this is we use this is uh, this taping is for being uh, this uh, this is an example of uh, when we are doing a meniscus taping for the joint stabilization i've taken started the tape from here all over the medial uh, ligament and over the joint line i'm putting an x tape to stabilize the meniscus part this is for your back pain uh, in this we put two i shaped tape parallel to each other and over the pain area this is the pain area and then we are putting a tape on erector spinae and when we are putting a tape on erector spinae there should be always a fold if the fold is there then only the muscle would be folded and stabilized this is being used commonly used in ankle sprain uh, there is an ITFL ankle sprain and how we are doing, we are just uh, put a tape uh, uh, the foot is in neutral put the tape over here and uh, at the ATFL part stabilize it put a second tape coming from here holding the ATFL and rounding up and again go to the heel and from the medial part again there is a hold so that the joint is in the neg uh, negative or no pressure and it is in neutral this is for IT band well, how we does it? Uh, we are putting the uh, tape from the uh, now. Uh, this is going to insertion to origin to hold the tape. In this, how we are doing it? We are holding it. Let me show you one thing. See, there are there are basic principles. Just hold on. There are basic principles. What we have to do when we are doing for muscle facilitation, we are doing origin to insertion. And when we are inhibiting, we are going insertion to origin. From here, when I just when I'm doing a IT band, we are going from insertion to origin of that, and we are stabilizing the joint by putting an X tape over here. Now this is for uh, anterior knee pain and patellofemoral pain syndrome. I have put a tape over here from uh, the quadriceps and going to the tibial to prostate and crossing it and holding the patella. And I'm do I've I've done the taping from here to here from from quadriceps to tibial to prostate and from tibial to prostate to quadriceps. And in turn the the patella is being totally pulled. This is for tennis elbow. Now, what, what I was telling that when we have to start the tape, we had never have to do the taping on the point of pain. The anchor is being put away from the point of pain and the, the taping is done in the loaded position. And what the, the, the tape would be done and hold it, your ring fingers and these two fingers are being folded and the muscle is folded like this to over ECRB. And then the lesion is being pushed Pushed and taped so that it hold and offload your uh, ECRB. This is again for your golfer's elbow. Same, same principle, same technique. This is the way how we do. If you have any question, please let me know. Rajiv sir. Ah, uh, th thank you, uh, Doctor Vikram. Any comment? Uh... Uh, Dr. Vishal and uh, Shikha Snail, your experience with the tapings, uh, do you use in your practice? Vishal sir does a lot. Hello Vishal, are you there? Yes sir, yes sir. Vishal, yes, sir. Using, uh, Vishal sir is my mentor and he is the person from whom I learned. So it would be... Uh, it will make me nervous if he asks anything from me. <laughs> no, don't worry. I am asking Dr. Vikram. Any, any uh, comment, comment, comment? Yes, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a good uh, it's a good technique by using a ta uh, uh, taping uh, prior to operation or after the surgery. It's good rehab. Uh, is a one of uh, kind of armory in our like that. It gives a good results uh, pre-operative, post-operative conditions. Hmm. Anything else on this?
हेलो यस सर लोकेश स्नेहल स्नेहल एनी कमेंट ऑन टेपिंग्स ओके uh i now we can conclude and thank you to all my faculty for sparing time especially our senior faculty members dr mrinal and our out uh, uh, abroad faculty dr andrew and uh, dr shika snail vishal and of course uh, not last and not least uh, dr vikram and thanks to all participant uh, participants and dr sham uh, for this uh, amazing and interactive webinar especially on uh the rehab and sports medicine part uh thank you thanks to all of you and uh, wish you a great uh, sunday uh thank you thank you thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you okay thanks